psalmist. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. Well, we begin our time of worship together by singing the words of that psalm, hymn number 103, and it's tune B. Praise 103B. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet your tribute being. Let's sing together 103B. as we sit, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, what a great privilege it is to call on you this evening, to gather here in your name. Father-like, he tends and spares us. Well, our feeble frame he knows. In his hands he gently bears us. 
rescues us from all our foes. How you've shown your great care to us down through the years. Your great faithfulness proven again and again. You have rescued us and will continue to do so until that great day when finally you will return and our salvation will be complete. When we shall be with you forever in a new creation and eternal rest. And how we long for that day. We yearn for it to be with you in all eternity. And how we need your help in the present as we face fresh challenges, fresh foes. So quickly we doubt your goodness, seeing only the problems and feeling only our fears. Help us to listen to you, to pay careful attention to your word and not, as we so often tend to do, live merely by sight. Help us to be a people of faith, to be those that walk by faith and not by what we see. So please draw near to us this evening. Speak tenderly as a father with his children. Feed us and nourish us by your word that we would be strengthened for the week ahead, strengthened to press on in the long term as faithful servants because you were first faithful to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, can I warmly welcome you here uh, this evening to the Tron Church. It's very good to see you and to gather together. You should have had one of the notice sheets uh, either this morning or if you didn't, there should be some on the way in uh, just outside. And just one or two things to draw to your attention for the week ahead. Uh, We meet on Wednesday evening for our congregational prayer meeting. And that'll be 7.30 and that's here. And uh, it'll be a particularly good thing to come along to, not only to pray together, but also to hear from uh, Roy Murray, one of our gospel partners, at, uh, as he tells us about his work uh, there in South America. It was good last time to hear from his brother, and this time we get to hear from Roy. So do come on Wednesday evening for that. Also, just after the service this evening, there'll be a little gathering about the Mark drama. We're going to be running that again this Easter, and Katie is looking to recruit a good squad of volunteers to help put that on. So if you want to find out a bit more about that, we'll be meeting after the service. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where, but uh, I'm sure you'll hear Katie and uh, gather to her. So that's after the service this evening. Also, a date for your diaries. On Wednesday, the 1st of March, we'll have our congregational family meeting. It's our annual uh, get-together as a church family to look forward to the year ahead and also to look back on the past year. Uh, as we think about what's to come. Uh, that'll be at Kelvin Grove. So rather than the usual prayer meeting here, we'll be meeting at Kelvin Grove, 7.30 on Wednesday, the 1st of March. So do stick that in your diaries. And also one final announcement, uh, a sad note, uh, but to, uh, to share the news that uh, Chrissy Smith uh, died earlier this week, and it'll be her funeral this Thursday uh, lunchtime. I'll be 12 noon at the Mary Hill Crematorium. It'll be good to see a good number of folk there uh, for those that remember Chrissy. So that's this Thursday, uh, 12 o'clock at Mary Hill Crematorium. Well, I think now we sing again uh, the hymn on the screens. Uh, when your dwelling is secure in the Lord's almighty shadow, our refuge, our fortress, the God whom we trust, a, a song that reminds us of God's Great faithfulness is steadfastness, and in him we have our refuge. Let's sing together.
Well, we turn now to our reading for this evening, which you'll find in Joshua. And it's Joshua chapter 23. So our penultimate week in the book. And this is the second of uh, the great gatherings under Joshua. Last week in chapter 21, uh, sorry, 22, we had uh, the first of those gatherings as Joshua summoned the eastern tribes that were being sent back east over the Jordan. And then in chapter 23, it's the second gathering, this time of all the peoples, all the leaders of the land. So we'll read chapter 23 together. I think it's page 197 in the Church Bibles. Joshua 23, verse 1. A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, and said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years. And you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you, And drive them out of your sight. And you shall possess their land, just as the Lord your God promised to you. Therefore, be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you, or make mention of the names of their gods, or swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them, but you shall cling to the Lord your God, just as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations. And as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts to flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you, just as he promised you. Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes, until... You perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. And now, I am about to go the way of all the earth, and you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. But just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you, if you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land that he has given to you. Amen. Well, this is the word of the Lord. Well, we sing again a hymn on the screens, a hymn which really is one of the uh, great themes of the book of Joshua. It's a book about the faithfulness of God, but also about the faithfulness that he calls his people to demonstrate. By faith, we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design in the lives of those who prove his faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight. Let's sing together.
Good. Well, now I think the offering for the Lord's work will be uplifted. So that's uh, the work not just here in Glasgow, but with gospel partners across the world. So perhaps as that's going on, you might want to read again those verses from Joshua 23. But as musicians play, the offering will be uplifted. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God who gives so generously to your people. And we pray that these uh, small offerings that we bring tonight, as well as offerings we give more regularly through other ways and for our time and talents, all these ways in which we seek to serve, we pray that these things might be used for the furtherance of your kingdom, for the work of the gospel, for the proclamation of the gospel, of the news of Christ's victory, of his kingship and of his coming judgment. So help us in that task, we pray. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. And so we ask, Father, that we might all be made competent, equipped for every good work. Nourish us this evening with your word, that we might be encouraged and equipped to endure, so that we might have hope, and that we might with one voice glorify ye. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we come to God's word in just a moment, we sing a hymn in our hymn books, number 546. God has spoken by his prophets, spoken his unchanging words, each from age to age proclaiming God the one the Righteous Lords, hymn number 546.
Good. Well, please do turn up uh, the passage we read earlier, Joshua chapter 23, and that's page 197 in there, the Blue Vista Bible. Joshua chapter 23. Now, do you ever wonder if you're going to make it in the long haul? Do you ever wonder if, as a Christian, you're going to make it? You're going to be keeping going one year, five years, ten years down the line. Perhaps you're a student and you're loving the fellowship of lots of folk your own age. Maybe it's in the CU or here at least the word. But perhaps you know the day is coming when you'll have to graduate. It does come, I'm afraid. And you know that you will maybe have to move on to move away from Glasgow, from this church. How you keep going in the long haul. Maybe you're in the throes of young family life. You can tell I am, bags under the eyes. Pressures in the workplace, maybe pressures at home. Aging parents are also demanding time. It feels like getting through the week is a major achievement. Will I really be able to keep going with the Lord 10 years, 20 years from now? Perhaps things haven't quite worked out as you hoped. You've not yet found the partner you thought you would find. Perhaps you realize the career that you've embarked upon isn't quite delivering all that it promised. You look on the years stretching ahead. Can I really keep things going, I wonder? Maybe you're retired recently. You spent decades giving your life in a job. You've endured some tough times. Perhaps friends of yours have recently passed away. You've been through relationship difficulties. You feel the the stuffing's been knocked out of you. How am I going to manage? How can I keep going as a Christian? But maybe you're in the winter of life. You look back on decades of faithful walking with the Lord, the ups and the downs. And you perhaps worry about the future for the church in this land. What will you pass on to the next generation? What words will you have for younger men and women as you see them Sunday by Sunday? Well, it's faithfulness in the long run that Joshua has at the very forefront of his mind in this chapter. This is the second of the great gatherings at the end of the book, at the end of his life. There are two. You can see that he is nearing the end of his life. He's getting old. And he gathers the leaders of the land. He urges them to continue to walk faithfully in the long run and to keep doing that in the midst of faithless nations. Yes, the conquest has been successful. Yes, the people have obeyed the Lord. Yes, faithfulness was demonstrated by the people over the few years of the conquest. But Joshua's concern reaches beyond the immediate horizon and he's looking into the long term for when he's no longer there look again at verse 7 he's concerned about these nations that they've been driving out he's concerned that these nations may prove a snare they may pull the Lord's people away from true worship of the living God and pull them towards a false worship of dead idols that would lead, in the end, to a forfeiting of the land. Again and again, Joshua refers to those nations. 21 times he refers to the nations and to the false gods of those nations in this short speech. And this was the great and enduring problem for the people of God. As you read on through the Old Testament, again and again, Israel runs after the gods of the nations. And it does, as you know, lead to exile, to banishment from the land. So what is Joshua's charge to the people? How does he encourage them to live faithfully in the midst of a faithless world? Three things Joshua underlines for Israel's leaders. And three things that stand true for God's people today. If you and I are going to stay the course if we're going to keep faithful to him, if we're going to enter that promised rest in the end, how do God's people live faithfully 
in a faithless world? Well, three things. Firstly, God's people know God's help in the past and so can be certain of it in the future. Secondly, God's people superglue themselves to God. And number three, God's people fear the certain judgment of God. So first then, God's people know God's help in the past and so can be certain of it for the future. And we see here in this chapter, yet again in this book of Joshua, the great note of God's enduring faithfulness to his people. That's been the constant refrain through the whole book. And it should be no surprise then that Joshua here, at the end of his life, in one of his closing addresses to his leaders, reminds them again of God's faithfulness. And he appeals to them as witnesses of God's faithfulness. Look there at verse 3. He says to them, And you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord who has fought for you. These men that he speaks with have seen with their own eyes the incredible victories brought about by the Lord. The crossing of the River Jordan, the victory at Jericho, the whole conquest. Again and again, it's the Lord who has clearly given his people the victory. Look on to verse 9. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations, It is the Lord, your God, who fights for you, just as he promised you. Look on again to verse 14. You know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord, your God, promised concerning you. All of them have come to pass. Not one has failed. They were eyewitnesses to the amazing victories God had brought them. Victories against all the odds. Victories against some fearsome-looking enemies. God had done great things for them. God had kept his promises. And that, according to Joshua, is the grounds for confidence for the future. God would continue to be faithful. Notice the future tense there in verse 5. He's just been talking about what God has done. And then verse 5, the Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight. And you shall possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. So the key, according to Joshua, for pressing on the long haul, for faithfulness over the long term, was a firm foundation in all that the Lord had already done. Now yes, some of those nations still needed cleared out. Some of their inheritance were yet to be fully claimed, but just look back on all that God has done. And with great and overwhelming power, he has destroyed enemy after enemy after enemy. So these ones in front of you, they won't pose a problem. The Lord has already done it. They had no reason, no grounds whatsoever for doubting God. Just look at all he's done. He has kept his promises in the past. And he'll keep on keeping them. God has kept his word so far, and surely he will continue to do so. Surely his promises were adequate for what lay ahead. And that was, and is, and always will be the foundation, the basis for the faithfulness of God's people. As you and I look out on the world, that wants to pull you away from the one true faith, as you feel the attraction of the rampant radical individualism that is all around us, that constant call to be yourself, to follow your dreams, to satisfy your desires, what is going to enable you to keep going with all that in the background, constantly in your ear? Well, you're pointed back to all that God has already done. You are pointed back to what he has done in the past. And his promise keeping didn't end with the conquest in Joshua. Ultimately, his promises were fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the promised son of David. He was the one who came as God's king and judge. And he came with great power and on the cross defeated the great enemy. 
He fulfilled all the great hopes of the Old Testament. And he will return one day. And on that day, he will fully and finally rescue his people. And he will judge his enemies. So you and I, we can look back on far greater victories than Joshua and the leaders of Israel did. And as we do so, we look back on what God has done in the past, and that gives us, gives you, great confidence, great certainty, absolute certainty for the future. But we don't just look back on the events recorded in the New Testament. We can look back on events in our own lives where God has demonstrated again and again his faithfulness to us. And it's not that life is always plain sailing, absolutely not. But we can look back, even on difficult times, and we can point to God's faithfulness shown to us again and again, shown to us in real and solid ways. Those little kindnesses he's shown us, those little reminders of his faithfulness, little assurances that he is with us, he will never leave nor forsake us. That is the God that we have. He will never leave nor forsake his people. He will never leave nor forsake you. And that is the thread that runs through Joshua's words here in chapter 23. It is the foundational truth that will keep those leaders going, that will keep you going in the long haul. God is and will always be faithful to his word and to his people. But not only is God faithful to his people. There is a flip side to that coin, which is this. God's people are to remain faithful to their God. And that's our second point. God's people superglue themselves to God. It is only in light of that great indicative, the indicative of God's faithfulness, that we come to Joshua's imperative. Notice, therefore, in verse 6, he's just been talking about all that God has done and the great certainty they can have for the future, verses 1 to 5. And then verse 6, therefore, be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside neither to the right hand nor to the left, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you, but you shall cling to the Lord your God, just as you've done to this day. Look on again to verse 11. Again, Joshua has just been speaking about God's faithfulness to them again and again. And then verse 11. Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them, so that you associate with them and they with you, you know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you. In light of who God is and all he's done, Joshua implores the people to cling to God, verse 8, and not to cling to the nations, verse 12. And that word cling, it means to cling tightly a process in which things are inseparably joined together. Now, the root of the Hebrew word here is the basis for the modern Hebrew word glue. Glue yourselves to God. Be superglued to him. It's a great image, isn't it? But what does that look like in reality? What does it mean to cling, to glue yourself to him? Well, two things. It means... Careful obedience to his word. Joshua is crystal clear, isn't he, there in verse 6? Therefore be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Now, not many years before these events here in Joshua 23, all the people heard Moses give three great sermons. We're in the midst of it on our Sunday mornings in the book of Deuteronomy. And Moses was teaching the people what had been revealed from the Lord, the way of life for the people that the Lord had rescued from Egypt. The ten words are spoken at Mount Sinai are reiterated and the implications spelled out. Here was the word of the Lord. 
Here was the way of the life of God's people in the land. They could be in no doubt about it. They were all there. They heard it. And here, Joshua is urging them to careful obedience of that word. No turning aside from it. They're not to veer off course from what God has said. Careful obedience to what God had said was going to be absolutely crucial and central if they were to consolidate the conquest and to live in the land. Careful obedience to his word. But careful obedience also means necessary separation. That is the great purpose of their obedience. It is to ensure and enable a necessary separation. A separation from the nations they were there to drive out so that they would continue to worship and serve the one true God and to be a witness to the watching world around them. Joshua rightly perceives these nations to be a great threat to the people of God and to their long-term future in the promised land. He keeps talking about the nations and about the gods of those nations because they represented a real threat and they presented a real lure away from the true worship of the living God and towards idolatry. There was great danger of comfortable compromise with these Gentile nations. Now these nations that Joshua talks about here, these were nations, these were peoples that were marked out for gross sin. And the conquest that we read about in the first half of Joshua, it records not just the fulfillment of promise for the people of God, but also of judgment on their enemies, on these nations, the Canaanites. Just listen to how these nations are described in Deuteronomy chapter 18. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall be not found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens. Because of these things, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. These were the kind of things that the nations were up to. Sacrificing their own sons and daughters. Practicing divination. This is why they were subject to the judgment of God. This is why Joshua is just so insistent here in chapter 23 that they separate themselves. This is what those nations were like. Don't go near them. Separate yourselves from those nations. And these nations were to be destroyed partially as a way of protecting the people of God from their corrupting influence. If tolerated, if they were allowed to remain in the land, then the idolatries of those nations would inevitably seep into the people of God. The lure of false religion would prove virtually impossible to resist. And the ongoing history of the people of God shows that. And the lure of false religion, of idolatry, is not something that's consigned to the Old Testament. We might well have thought we're off the hook, as I read about what they're up to back there in Deuteronomy. But it remains a live issue for the people of God today. False religions... Idolatry holds real power today, and it is firmly addressed in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 speaks of this generation of Israelites as an example, as a warning. And he urges the New Testament church to flee idolatry, to flee false worship. Perhaps it's the lure of the impressive and spectacular prosperity gospel that you might bump into late night on TV, on one of those channels. Perhaps more likely, it's the relentless secular gospel that fills the air that we breathe, the drip, drip message of the autonomous self, the rejection of any sort of objective truth. It's the theology of Disney that tells our youngsters to break free from all they've known 
and to look within, to find the hero inside themselves, to discover their truth, to discover real identity. All that has great appeal, doesn't it? It's dressed up in the, in the glamour of Hollywood. It's sung by beautiful pop stars. It lures us away from the one true God. It lures us away from worship of the one who demands exclusive worship and wholehearted service. But here in Joshua 23, one particular threat is mentioned. One particular aspect of the dangerous lure of the nations. And it's the danger of the people tying themselves to the nations. That same word, cling, is used there in verse 12. For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you. Earlier in the chapter, Joshua urged the people to superglue themselves to God. Well, here he's urging them not to superglue themselves to the nations. The two things are exclusive. You can't be glued to God and also glued to the nations. He urges them not to be glued to the nations. And the key example he uses here is marriage. Look down at the second half of verse 12. He warns them about making marriages with the nations. Don't allow your children to marry the children of the nations, because they will, in the end, prove a snare, a trap, verse 13. It was the very issue that Nehemiah, centuries later, had to deal with in chapter 13 of that book. It's the same issue that Paul addresses in 2 Corinthians 6, where he warns against the Christians there of being unequally yoked with non-believers. So one key implication of the people of God supergluing themselves to God is that they separate themselves from unbelievers, and particularly so in the area of marriage. So I'll say this very simply and straightforwardly. If you are a Christian here this evening and you're not married, do not for a second contemplate marrying a non-Christian. Do not for a second consider marrying an unbeliever. And an implication of that is don't date non-believers. Now, of course, there are lots of different situations that folk might find themselves in. Perhaps you got married before you became a Christian, and later on you're converted, but your partner isn't. Well, Josh is not talking about that sort of situation here. He is talking about those who are presently unmarried. If you're a Christian, if you're not currently married, but perhaps one day hope to be, you're to marry a Christian. And it may be that your hopes are frustrated. You've not yet met someone. And those longings are not helped by a culture that urges us, that tells us, that shouts at us, that fulfillment as a human being is only found in sexual fulfillment. That's a great pressure, isn't it? And so there will be temptation, real and strong, to go for that drink with the attractive, witty, intelligent non-believer. Temptation to pursue a relationship, to pursue marriage. Well, heed the warning of Joshua. Heed the warning of how things played out with the people of God in the long run. It does not go well. And in the end, they forfeit the land. Their witness to the surrounding nations is totally compromised. And we too need the realism of this warning so that we are able to face the challenges of the day, that we are able to maintain the integrity and purity of the church because the church is the witness to the watching world. We are the witness to the gospel. So heed the warning of the Apostle Paul, who urges us to take care lest we fall. So how are God's people to live faithfully in a faithless world? Well, firstly, it's that God's people know God's help in the past and so can be certain of it in the future. And secondly, God's people are to superglue themselves to God. 
and by implication to not superglue themselves to other things. And so lastly, our third point, how do God's people live faithfully in a faithless world? Well, God's people fear the certain judgment of God. It would be lovely if Joshua finished his sermon at verse 14. Wouldn't that make for a great final point to the sermon? Listen to this. Not one word has failed of all the good things the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. Done. Final hymn. But no, Joshua carries on. And it's a hard word. God keeps his promises, yes. But just as he promises blessing for obedience, so he also will fulfill his promised curse for disobedience. Joshua doesn't hold back from reminding the people that if they are to make it in the long run, if they are to remain in the land, then they are to remain faithful to God because there are consequences for disobedience. God wouldn't just turn a blind eye if the people lived however they liked, if they ignored his word. And that is why the way of faith for God's people at all times, and it's not wrong for that to be a motivation for faithfulness, knowing that God will keep his promises, both in terms of blessing and also in terms of cursing. That is a real and legitimate motivation for obedience, for remaining faithful to him. Now hold on, you might say. Joshua's just being a bit underhanded here, isn't he? He's just trying to scare them into being faithful. Well, yes, I guess in a way he is. The Lord your God is not a tame God. He is the living God, the creator of heaven and earth. His son, Jesus, is the Christ. He is the Lord and the promised judge. He is returning one day, and he will come in judgment. And that is a fearful prospect. Knowing that Jesus is judge and will one day return to judge the living and the dead, that is one good reason to stay the course now, to stay faithful to him. God has made great promises to his people. Promises of land and promises of rest. And they weren't just promises for Joshua and the people then. God promises his people today an eternal rest and a new creation and a new heavens and a new earth. His promises will not fail. All will come to pass. So will you cling to him? Will you trust him? Trust that he will do just as he says. Will you superglue yourself to him? Resist the lure of the unfaithful world around you? And will you heed God's gracious warning of judgment because he won't, in the end, allow rejection of him to be ignored? How do we remain faithful in the long run? Well, we do it by hearing and heeding Joshua chapter 23. Let me pray. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass. Not one of them has failed. Lord, we look out at a world that perplexes us. We feel the pressure to walk away from faithful service of you. We feel the pressure for compromise. We feel the pressure to go the way of the world. And Lord, we do sometimes wonder how we might make it in the long run. But Lord, these words speak tenderly to us. They reassure us 
of your great faithfulness, of your great promise keeping, and all that you promise to do for your people. So help us to heed the warning and to cling to you. There is no safer place to be. So help us, Father. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we close our time together by singing hymn number 869, a hymn which reminds us of the gracious ways in which the Lord leads and guards us. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Hymn number 869. Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.